up everybody, it's Soren Baker here on Unique Access and today we're joined by Bill Duke, the esteemed writer, director, and actor. Thank you for coming through, sir. Good to be here. Yes, yes. So Bill, you have done so much throughout your career and one of the things that uh, has been one of the hallmarks is your work with rappers. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently you just did the SBU with Ice-T. Yes. So um, what drew you to that project? Uh, I like the show. I watched it for years. You know, Dick, Dick Wolf, and um, it's uh, it's a great show. And uh, I like Ice T also, and the people that were on it. So we had a great time. Mm -hmm. And with with Ice T, obviously he came from a career of being a gangster rapper, and now he's a police officer on the, on the show. So what do you think? Eighteenth year, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think of his evolution going from being a gangster rapper into being a police officer? <laughs> I think it's a smart move. I think it's a, it's really done a great deal for his career. Absolutely. Um, I think that um, the show is not just about police. It's about you know special victims unit. You know, so right. it has some real depth to it. Great writing. So I think it was a wise decision for him overall. Yeah, and, and with the two show arc that you were on, uh, you're involved in the legal system, of course, being a, a defendant. Uh, representing Brad Garrett, but also it, it talks a lot about the corruption within the police department in particular uh, on those two episodes. So with that being said, that's very uh, relevant to today's times and what's going on with mm -hmm. a lot of police brutality and some of the social movements that have been going on. So when you get a type of script like that, that not only is well written and, and well conceived, but also has a lot of uh, ties to what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. What extra does that mean to you as an actor? Well, if you can be involved with your directing, producing, writing, or acting, that's something that's relevant. It's rewarding, because it's not just, you know, topical stuff. I mean, it deals with issues that are relevant, and you're a part of it, and hopefully it gives insight mm -hmm. into certain subject matters. And so, it's what I like to do. I, I, I really enjoy, um, good writing because right. it makes a big difference and being able to tell stories these days you know to really tell great stories is rare unfortunately right now let's take it back to one of your prominent things that you did uh, several years ago with uh, <clears throat> getting actually Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg uh, into the game as far as a collaborative team with Deep Cover that you directed and they of course had the title track to the soundtrack and, and the title song so when you when you were directing this film and, and getting it going, what made the Dr. Dre Snoop Doggy Dog at the time, <laughs> Snoop Doggy <laughs> Dog deep cover song, what made that the perfect match to go with the film? Oh, they, at that time, in terms of rap music, those were two of the top guys. I mean, they were just, they were coming up and, but they had substance to their music, etc. as Snoop always has, interesting, unique. Right. And I wanted a sound that was different. You know, not just beats, but something that had lyrics had some meaning. And when they did the song for Deep Cover and some of the other music for it, it kind of like, you know, music for a film is important. Right. I mean, it, it, you know, if you have a scene that's meaningful and the right music is there, it enriches the scene. And that's what uh, I think their music did. Right. And that song, of course, rap. That was 1992 when the song and the film came out and, and at that time of course there were a lot of things going on with Rodney King and different things and, and the film and the song talked about an undercover cop and Snoop in particular says 187 on an under, undercover mm -hmm. cop talking mm -hmm. about killing the cop mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there was a, back then unfortunately it remains today a lot of unrest and especially in the black community with law enforcement so with that song when you were hearing it and hearing what Snoop was saying in that, what what was your immediate emotional response? Uh, I understood the uh, feelings uh, that he had, particularly at the time, because there were a lot of things going on in our streets where um, young men were being, particularly young men, black men, were being um, killed um, and there are unfortunate parallels to today. Right. Uh, some some things have changed, some things have not. Um, but those guys represented a voice at that time of the street. Right. And the frustration 
of the street at that particular time. So it was something that um, I think fit well, well with the film. Um, and based upon the uh, film itself, it came from a book called Deep Cover, which was uh, written by a former um, DEA officer mm -hmm. who was kicked out of the DEA, so. Right. Now, uh, on the flip side of that, probably your most memorable role in the rap world was in Menace to Society. Mm -hmm. And in that one, you're on the other side of the law. You're the one catching... No, you don't fuck them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're I'm, the sorry. One... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so with Menace to Society, you're on the other side of the law. And your famous line, uh, you know, you don't fucked up. With that, why do you think that that line took on kind of its own life? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I think uh, a lot of it had to do with... You know, um, one of those, one of those, one of the things that those boys in the film did not have is a father. A lot of them, you know. Right. And that authority figure of that that particular police officer at that time, uh, when I saw the film, reminded me of my dad. You know, we tried to get over on him, <laughs> and he would just look at us. You know what I mean? Because he just he you now he 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 would always say sometimes like you know. I'm not as dumb as you look. Okay. It's, it's like, because we try to lie and be slick and cry and everything. And then he would say, um, yeah, yeah, go and get that switch. <laughs> so you get yourself ready. It's just, but he would listen. Okay. He would listen. He would let you tell your story. Tell the whole story, yeah, keep going. Get it out. But oh, that's really good. Go get that switch. <laughs> <laughs> now that uh, Menace to Society, of course, is an iconic film. Uh, in the rap world, in the urban community. And I think it also, MC8 had a, a huge uh, role in there and, and was very important as a uh, AWACS. And then it also helped usher in the, the hood movie genre, mm -hmm. as well as New Jack City, Boys in the Hood, of course. And this one kind of put the cherry on top because mm -hmm. this film with Menace to Society in particular was more violent, I would say, overtly than New Jack City or Boys in the Hood. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that adding that element of violence in a way that New Jack City and Boys in the Hood hadn't meant to what Menace to Society was? Well, I think it told the truth. Okay. You know, it told the truth about the streets and what was happening. And unfortunately, what continues to happen. Um, the fighting over what is the question. Right. And the thing is, is that... Um, I think it told the truth, and I think the Hughes brothers were courageous in that sense because they just put it right there in your face. Right. Um, and, uh, but I do think there, what I did like about the film, there are moments of compassion. Right. Because we write these kids off. We just do a lot of the times. And the film didn't. It gave you insight in terms of their pain, yeah, their violence. And perspective. Yes, but their pain, right. they were going through, their confusion, uh, whatever, but it gives you a deeper insight. Right. Yeah, it's very powerful, and that, I think that's why the film resonated and mm -hmm. continues to do so. And flipping the script, showing your versatility, you also directed uh, Sister Act 2 with Lauren Hill mm -hmm. and appeared in it as well. But with that, totally switching gears, uh, how was it being able to work and direct and collaborate with Lauren Hill, which was totally different from Deep Cover, totally different from Menace to Society, but not too, not too much after that, to do a totally different type of project mm -hmm. and also be working with a rapper, with Lauren Hill. Like what, how does that work as far as switching what you're able to do and, and adjusting it accordingly? Well, you know, um, film is really um, specifically a, a specific discipline. So whatever the subject matter is, if you can tell a story, no matter what the genre is, right. uh, that's what the connecting force in terms of just the, the structure in, of film. Um, working with Lauren um, and Sister Act 2 and Whoopi Goldberg, right. uh, which was, she was the foundation of it. Sister Act 1 had already occurred, uh, had great success, but luckily I was out to do Sister Act 2. And there was a foundation already set. 
And so I walked into the structure of that. It's a good situation. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, working with Lauren, um, I mean, I say brilliantly talented. Um, she, she really is a genius, you know. She um, has great talent as a singer, as you know. But as an actress who she was able to make you feel. Right. I mean, for her and that character. And uh, I think that's what made it identifiable for a lot of young people. They, they knew her through her experience on, on that film, you know. Right. And, and, and people still talk about that. And another one of your high profile uh, films also deals with the, one of the other primary main female rappers of all time, which was Queen Latifah appearing in Hoodlum. Mm -hmm. And that takes it back a bit. So with her and with Lauren Hill, they're both extremely talented and acclaimed singers and actor, mm -hmm. actresses. So with Queen Latifah, like with Lauren Hill, you, you worked with her early on in her film career. So what did you see from her interaction with the Lawrence Fishburns and the, and the other big actors, you know, the Tim Ross, et cetera, that were also in Hoodlum. What did you see with Queen Latifah that was memorable or noteworthy as you look back? Uh, Queen Latifah has chops. <laughs> I mean, she she's not just a surface actress. I mean, she can go, she can go deep. Mm -hmm. Do you see her in Betsy? Yeah. Oh, she was brilliant. Absolutely. She, she brought a lot of uh, depth there as well. And I think, you know, Queen Latifah has been able to navigate these worlds and play these super serious characters, become Oscar nominated mm -hmm. for what she did mm -hmm. in Chicago, but then also show a little more of the comedic side with some of the lighter fare that she's right. done. Right. And speaking to Chops, what did you see with her versatility back then in Hoodlum that makes you understand why she's been successful today? Well, that was one of her beginning films, but... Um you could see that once she could take direction, once uh, two, she didn't just play the surface of the character. I mean, she took, it wasn't a big role, but she took the time to really dig into who that person was. So you, you knew at that time even that she was not just doing lines as a rapper, she was taking act, acting seriously. Right. And that was, that was a great thing to see. Right. Now, one of the uh, main blockbuster successes that uh, you had also worked with was DMX, mm -hmm. who at one time was the biggest rapper and then he signed a huge deal with Joe Silver, had a super successful run of uh, action films, and one of them was one that you appeared in, Exit Wounds. So with DMX, uh, I thought it was amazing that this guy had come from this gangster rapper, or hardcore rapper I should say, that was very intense, but also had a very spiritual side to his music mm -hmm. and very emotional, and then was able to just seamlessly transform into this action hero. So by the time that you worked with him on Exit Wounds, he had done several films and had huge success. So when you're getting on the set with him, was he acting like an A-list uh, super action hero guy, or was he just acting like a rapper or acting like a normal guy? What was, what was DMX like? Uh, well, I think that he rose to the occasion of the cast that he was with mm -hmm. at that time. And um, he was professional. He was on the set um, on time. I mean, he, he, he came through as a professional. And so as a result of that, you know, I think wh what he did speaks for itself in terms of the role. Right. And so um, he worked hard. and with the rest of the actors and say so he was respectful also. Right. And I think with DMX too, people don't understand the magnitude of like signing the deal with Joe Silver. So for people that are not familiar with how the film industry works, I wanted you to really explain, given your pedigree and your resume, explain to people what does it mean that DMX signed a deal with the producer of the magnitude of Joe Silver? Well, you're under a lot of pressure. <laughs> yes, you got to deliver. Because you got to deliver. Right. And um, you you didn't start out as an actor. Right. But as a musician. Right. And so you're catching, you're, you're, it's on the job training to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And so I can understand. And it's like people come into this business thinking that it's easy to you know, get up there and say lines or whatever. No, but you're under 
constant pressure. You got to be on the set at a certain time. You work 12 to 16 hour days and you got to deliver. And so uh, there's a lot of pressure on him. Now, how did things switch when you directed his Angel movie with DMX? I think at that time he was going through a transition. So um, it was it was fun working with him. But I think he was doing something else at the same time. So we were, you know, we had to wait a lot in terms of the set, those kinds of things. And he would apologize when he came, but things were going to a couple of different projects at the same time. Yeah. And how, since you've often done that yourself, working on things, whether as an actor or a director, how have you been able to kind of navigate and balance, you know, switching those different hats from project to project? And sometimes when you act and direct something at the same time, how have you found that you're able to kind of switch those gears yourself? My check. <laughs> so it helps to. <laughs> Sorry. Hey man, it is what it is though. It is what it is. That check helps. It helps keep you focused okay. on the straight and narrow. Damn. <laughs> Bill knows, man. Bill knows. Yes. You're my mentor, man. Come on. You took that check. Come on. Yeah, you know. Everybody's got to get it, man. Everybody's got to get it. Yeah. And speaking of big checks, somebody that's gotten several of them throughout his career is 50 Cent. And you have a pivotal role in his uh, feature mm -hmm feature film debut, Get Richard Die Trying, mm -hmm. which was also a tremendous blockbuster when it was released. Now with 50 Cent, like DMX, and like a lot of the people you work with, they didn't come from an acting background. Right. And I remember when you were filming it, you had told me uh, right after it actually that he, he was probably one of the more professional people you had ever dealt with. So what, you've been in the business a long time and worked with hundreds, thousands of people. What what was it about 50 Cent that made it stand out to you so that when you and I were talking five, six years ago, you were like, man, this guy was so professional. He was, what, what was different about 50 Cent? Well, the rapper 50 Cent is a character. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? It's a character that he plays. But he's a businessman. And when you're on the set, that's you, who you meet, the businessman. Mm. Um, and he doesn't only require it of himself, but you know, people around him, I think he expects them to do, you come to do the work. You're on time, you work hard, you don't leave until the work is done, there's no excuses, and let's get going and do it. Right. And that's the kind of leadership he provides. And so working with him was, it was really, I mean, you know, because he comes off like, you know, a, a, this character in the rapping. But he, the language and, and, and uh, how he deals with business uh, on the set when he's not on camera, it's like a different person. Hmm. I mean, total businessman. Yeah, and that being said, you've just with 50 Cent, Snoop, and Dr. Dre, Queen Latifah, you've dealt with and worked with some of the biggest people in rap music history mm -hmm. and worked at them with a high level, DMX included, of course. So that being said, what have you noticed about these successful artists in rap and why they've been able to make that transition so seamlessly? I think that they're, they're brilliant in the sense that they understand the industry. Okay. Um, someone told me once, there ain't no God in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't understand that you're not gonna go up all the time, but there are certain dips that you face you have to prepare yourself for that. And you have to be able to be multifaceted in terms of your talent. You can't just rely on music for the rest of your life or, I mean, what other things can you get involved in that maintain the longevity of your brand? Right. And so they were smart enough at an early age to understand that through their managers, agents, or whatever. But those people that understood that um, have survived. Right. Till to this day. Yeah. I mean, you know, your recent work on SVU is a prime example of Ice T coming from helping popularize and, and break through gangster rap on a commercial level that he mm -hmm. did in the in the late nineteen mid to late nineteen eighties to now being on Law and Order SVU for seventeen, eighteen mm -hmm. years is mm -hmm. remarkable to be able to make that transition and all the 
box office success that he's had as well. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a testament to that. And uh, as you as you see the entertainment industry evolve, what do you think rappers are doing to help push film and television forward? If you look at Beyonce's last work, right, Lemonade. Uh, yes, as she is working as a black female in this industry, she realizes right now today that she wants to leverage her brand in terms of not just being in front of the camera, but behind the camera right. and, and conceptualizing uh, ideas for films and those kinds of things. Not the first time she's done it, uh, but the way that she's thinking, I think is very, 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 very smart. I think that the music itself is coming up with new people all the time. Right. And they're expressing the feelings and everything of this new generation. Um, so I'm just saying, but you know, it's it's new, it's different, but people are adapting to the, the reality of what that really is. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be interesting to see uh, where this music is going over the next 10 to 15 years. So one of the other things that's big uh, right now is the Empire, and mm -hmm. on that obviously it stars Taraji P. Henson, who you've worked with extensively throughout your career, and you even helped mentor her earlier in her career. Mm -hmm. So, what have you seen with the evolution of the way, especially now with the black women seem to be having more diverse roles, getting bigger opportunities, uh, you know, even getting away with murder, dark, you know, dark roles. You had uh, Ms. Mm -hmm. Davis in there as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So what have you seen with the progression of Taraji P. Henson's career and how that mirrors some of the other opportunities that are happening in Hollywood? I think uh, it's a celebration to see it. And I think there has to be more. Right. Um, you know, I just, I just think that we need to be producing more product because there are so many talented people um, that need a voice. And right now, uh, minority films annually, approximately out of the five or 600 that come out of Hollywood every year, maybe 12, 13. Right. Um, if that ratio could be increased to 50 to 100, um, I think that the evolution of what you're seeing now will blossom. Right. And that there will be um, a real new innovative way of looking at film etc i just think that we need the opportunity to explore more mm -hmm. and to really think about film as it exists now and what it could be you know it's like when i saw years ago this film run lola run mm -hmm. and the sonata format of it came from a great young german mind right there are young people out there now with that same kind of brilliance that need the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And it's not only about black content, I'm saying they have black faces and Hispanic faces and female faces, but they need the opportunity to express those visions and that's what I hope they'll get more of in the future. And I think we should also speak to that as you as a director with the Cemetery Club, for instance, because I remember uh, we've talked about this over the years, but I remember people were surprised, quote unquote, that you could direct an all white cast. <laughs> so, or at least that's what they said. So what, uh, when that is happening, like how do you even deal with that? Like what is? Uh, <laughs> I, I, every time I went on tour, we did a national tour at Cemetery Club and um, you know, Diane Ladd, Ellen Burstyn, Olympia Dukakis, three great actresses. Um, it's about, you know, basically that they were all friends and their husbands died, all three of them, and they formed a club of survival and mutual comfort, etc. Right. And uh, there was not one interview I did when I was in the row with the film where some reporter did not ask me that question. You know, you're... <laughs> You're, um, these are three Jewish women, and um, you are, um, what made, how can you, you know, they get almost stuttered, but they want to say, how could you direct that film? That's what they kind of wanted to say. Right. 
And my response usually was, well, because they're human beings. Right. And I've experienced death in my family since I'm human. And I understand that. Um, I understand what they went through and I wanted to. So they would continue, yeah, but you know, they're not, you know, they're not your same culture. I was saying, well, well, Steven Spielberg directed The Color Purple. And here's the answer I would get every single time. But that's different. <laughs> it's different because it's Steven Spielberg? Or <laughs> what, what made it different? I didn't even bother to ask. You, you never found I mean, that out? And, and I, no, I know what it was. <laughs> I, never, I never bothered to ask because it's not worth the, you know. And that, and that, but it's important to me because in the sense that we have to jump out of our boxes. I mean, the boxes that we try to get to lock us into, got to jump out because if what you do as a filmmaker is only limited to your skin, it limits, limits what you can talk about. It's interesting that this is happening with you as a director because I think it's, it's also noteworthy that you've been directing way before you started directing uh, films that also featured rappers from you know, in the 70s and 80s mm -hmm. directing television. But when, you, when you're working as a director in particular and you have, you know, there's always the stigma and I imagine it was worse earlier on that rappers can't act or they're stealing jobs from actors that are really involved in acting and these different types of things. When you're doing a hoodlum, when you're doing a sister act too, when you're doing, you know, these type of films and even DMX's uh, Angel Project, how do you balance that perception maybe with the rest of the cast or the crew and you having to balance that out and, and maybe you have to fight against it or did you never have to worry about that? Well, you're always questioned. Okay. Um, you know, um, but you know, it never bothered me because, you know, for me, uh, when I hire actors, they're actors that can do the job. Okay. And so, um, when people come to me and audition with their rappers, it makes no difference. I'm looking, can you do the job? That's the <laughs> bottom line. That's usually the important thing. That's the, listen. And, um, of course, your name is this or that, but if you can't really realize the character mm -hmm. and it's going to help destroy the film, I can't give you the job. Right. But if I, be I believe that you can actually deliver, then why not? So with Queen Latifah, with Lauryn Hill, with DMX, some of the uh, rappers you have directed, what do you remember as like a particularly good question or something that they did that's very memorable that kind of stuck with you? You know, I think Lauryn Hill, um, you know, it's... In Sister Act 2, she was rebellious um, but she also was able to play the heart of it mm. in other words in the end she loved her mother and she understood what her mother was trying to do for her um, but like most young people you know they fight but to surrender to that on screen is not the easiest thing in the world to do right and she was it's vulnerability to, well Vulnerability, it's easy to say, but <laughs> when that camera's in a close-up and uh, you're asked to let us see inside your soul, it's, um, but she was able to do it. Right. Yeah. She's a very talented lady. Right. Okay. All right. Well, we appreciate you coming through, Bill, for uh, Unique Access with Soren Baker. Bill Duke, thank you for coming through, sir. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, always a pleasure. It. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a fifty thousand dollar car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for 
just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your MTV back for that WA? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gang bang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.